Welcome to the Night Shift Podcast. That's right. It has changed. My name is Jeff Sharon. Along with me here, Kyle Nash, Andrew Glukov. We got Bryson Turner, Nick Porcelli in the house as well. Uh, Eric is going to join us in a little bit. Yes, we have rebranded. All right. So I owe all of you an explanation. I did this a couple, you know, a while ago. So we were going to SB Nation, obviously getting out of the podcast business. And uh, they gave us the podcast, but we had to rebrand it because um, they didn't want their, because obviously we're keeping the site around on SB Nation, but not the podcast. So they enabled us to, they allowed us to rebrand. And so we are rebranding as the Night Shift podcast to go along with our Night Shift uh, video streams that we usually do. Um, I, uh, you know, first of all, Thank you to SB Nation for actually giving us a much wider audience for our podcast. You don't have to change anything with your feeds. Everything just got updated. You're just going to see a different logo pop up in your feed. It's the same people with, you know, same bat time, same bat channel, the whole nine. It's just you know, a little a little switch up. You still you still got to deal with all of us, okay? So just yeah. accept it. But the same host with this ridiculous affinity for this garbage powder blue, all of that. Get I apologize yourself. to everyone Get, in advance who have to listen to us. <laughs> uh, well, well, listen, it's, you know, you, you <laughs> says that, but, you know, so you, listen, you got nobody blame for, to blame for this, but yourself, people. I mean, you're the one who chooses to subscribe to us. So here you go. You know what you're getting. We've been around for, for eight years now. You understand this. All right. Uh, we got, uh, so that's why last week we took, we took the week off because, uh, we were getting the feed kind of like moved over and it was taking a little bit longer than we thought. So I was like, ah, you know what? Let's just, let's, let's have a little, a little uh, sabbatical, if you will, and allow things to catch up. And here we are. So um, you can still follow us individually, Jeff underscore Sharon, uh, VSOTG for Kyle, for the student of the game. Uh, Drew is still at Stat Boy Drew. Uh, Bryson is joining us. He's at It's Bryson Turner. Nick Porcelli is at Nick Porcelli too. we got, Plenty of things to talk about. Special guest today, speaking of transitions, Ryan Swoboda joins us. Kyle uh, spoke to Ryan earlier uh, last week as Ryan prepares to go to the NFL draft. Uh, we will he, we'll have him in segment two. We're going to talk about the men's basketball personnel moves that have been, that have been made. We're going to talk a little baseball, conference play underway. Didn't get underway the way UCF would have preferred. But, um, and uh, we'll also have softball. We're thinking Lopez will join us eventually, but we're not 100% sure. So we'll see. Um, you know, and if kinda... he doesn't, you still have the great Bryson Turner on yeah. hand. And, and Nick is here. He can and talk Nick about, tra- well. he's going to talk about track and field. We're going to talk a little XFL. Orlando Guardians got their first win of the season this week, thanks to one Terrence Plummer, who had a great game against the, uh, the no longer undefeated DC defenders. Um, it's fantastic. So let's go ahead and start about to start with, uh, men's basketball here. All right. So season comes to an end and lo and behold, free agency is here. Uh, I think that's what we can call it now. Right. Uh, in the past, Jeff, right. Um, the, uh, let me go ahead and pull this up. Cause I want to, I want to go ahead and show everybody here. Um, the, uh, so far we've seen, Five players announced that they are entering the portal. Two of them are not a surprise, actually. They actually walked on senior day, Ty Freeman and Brandon Suggs. Um, Lahat Chun also entered. P.J. Edwards also entered. Jalen Young also entered. Uh, Chun has one year of eligibility left. P.J. has three. Jalen has two. Um, Thanks, by the way, to Bryson for uh, putting together our little table on the transfer portal tracker, which you can find on blackandgoldbanneret.com. Yay Yay, tables. Yes. (laughs) Tables tables will save us. Um, Yay for data. Uh, And this is in addition to Taylor Hendricks obviously announcing that he is leaving for uh, the NBA. And uh, I, I think we're pretty much in agreement, guys, right? That none of us think he's going to actually return like Taco Fall and B.J. Taylor did, right? Like he's 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 on his way. So a lot of, uh, so a lot of changes to uh, this roster once again as they head to um, the Big 12. And uh, Kyle, I want to start with you having followed this team as closely as you have over the past couple seasons. Um, 
I mean, obviously, Taylor is going to be the big talent loss, right? We all know that. I think we can put that aside. So right. outside of Hendricks, which of these guys do you think is really the big loss that that they're, that UCF can look at and be like, oh, man, we I really wish we got you know one more one more year out of this guy. I, I got to be honest. For me, it's Jalen Young. Um, now, granted, you know you're a guy who, who started out in JUCO, got an opportunity to get a lot of playing time, got a lot of opportunity to be seen um, with the way that um, Darius Johnson was injured and missing throughout so much of it, and had trouble getting back into the rhythm at times. You know, apparently he's, you know, Darius Johnson is the target of Drew Glukov's uh, latest criticism now that Darius Perry has uh, graduated. So from one Darius to the next comes uh, Stat Boy's ire there. I joke. Uh, the punch- consistent. In some way, yeah. Just give him credit for that. <laughs> that and the position, right? No, um, but li- li- listen, I make jokes, but like um, Jalen Young for me, especially with what um, Coach Dawkins did last year, if he has a pair of guys that can reliably bring up the ball from the point guard position um, and has, you know, if if you have two point guards on the floor, he could do some tricky things with that. Not that they did that throughout the season as such, but there are there are times where that was employed. And Darius is big enough to where he's a passable shooting guard as well, you know, just – and who knows if if injury history is starting to become a thing with Darius Johnson, who is the backup policy. And by the way, on top of missing, missing now, CJ Kelly, which we knew about because, you know, he we knew he was going to age out um, for all the great stuff he did, you know, um, here at UCF for the one year. For me, Jalen Young is really that guy who would I have liked to see build and, and see what's going to come next from him. But by the same token, the way he came out and and broke out with this group striking while the iron is hot, I get it. Yeah, I I, I mean I, I I'm with you on that one. Um, you know, I thought that PJ Edwards was really starting to hit a stride as maybe a guy who could uh could supplant uh Jalen in that respect. Um you know, Jalen, I thought, you know, he he really brought in a a, a, me, a a measure of stability, especially during those times when Darius was hurt, you know, like you were saying, Kyle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Lahat Chun uh, played, obviously, you know, and thanks again to Bryson for this, you know, 34 games. Um, I think that he was kind of thrown in a little, you know, a little bit too, uh, m- way more than Johnny Dawkins would have preferred well, because sure. of the injury to Michael Durr. Um, and in fairness, Jeff, you have to say injuries as in affecting the pool of the front court, right? CJ Walker obviously needs to be accounted for missing there too, right? Yeah, you know? that's true. So there's that. So yeah. And so he was forced into a role that I think that he really wasn't, you know, on paper expected to perform this year. So. Right. Exactly. I'm going to miss Ty Freeman. Um, I thought that he was like a really good glue guy for the team. I'm going to miss Brandon Suggs because he also did the same. It was an outstanding defender. I thought he was the, he, I thought he was the team's best backcourt defender um, all season. Uh, you know, he, he really, and, and we saw that, you know, late, uh, late in the season, you know, Johnny used him as a, as a, as a stopper. Um, now everyone obviously freaking out all these guys. So this is five guys plus Taylor. So that's six during six, Kelly. Yeah. That's eight. Right. Right. So eight open spots. Um, and I want to see if I can pull it up on uh, – now, now, UCF is targeting Khalif Battle. Uh, for those of you who don't remember Khalif Battle, he played for uh, Temple. Um, now, somebody reported – I forget who it was – but uh, th- that he was on the verge of committing to UCF, and then Khalif went on social media himself on Twitter and said, mm-mm-mm. Uh, not so much. Uh, I am still, um, I'm still, you know, feeling things out. So I, you know, we can't make that, um, that conclude. Although, you know, it's good to be, it's good to know that Khalif, I mean, Khalif was pretty good this past year for Temple. Excellent um, shooter. Yeah. Very, very good shooter. Um, I'm interested in seeing, all right, well, I mean, you know, what are we going to do? Talk about what they need. They need pretty much, you know, they need a, lo- a little bit of everything here. Let's start um, with what they have working for them, Jeff, right? How about that? Let's do this. Okay, <laughs> let's go there. Let's 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 start with the good here. All right, carry I on. Mean, even despite Drew's disdain, I joke with the <clears> disdain <throat> part, Drew, uh, for, um, for Darius Johnson, what he is as a leader, 
I, I mean, listen, everybody who's come in has cited it as somebody who, where he has helped them get involved, among them Taylor Hendricks, by the way, helped them kind of get used to things. And, heck, part of the reason why um, uh, um, Taylor Hendricks w- if we evolved more playing on the perimeter, which, by the way, is an absolute necessary skill in the NBA now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that, that evolution that he had to, to kind of become a three-point threat over and above blocking shots and, and being a force in the paint, um, Hendricks himself kind of credited – Darius Johnson for his involvement in evolution doing that while here at UCF. And, and the guy's been a leadership force, I would even say, since freshman year, right? As a quick throwback, Jeff. What's that moment we talked about with him and Sheik and Bakke Jong, which, by the way, any excuse to say that man's name is a good one, um, <laughs> where he, as a fi- uh, fifth-year uh, center transfer, came up to run a play, and freshman Darius Johnson waves him off. And what happens? They end up scoring because he took it to the hole with the opening, right? <laughs> that's 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 what we're building on, and now it's two more years after that. The dude's always had had a presence talking in the media. Has always had a presence calming guys down, like a C.J. Walker, who is a presence here, who is definitely the statesman of this group, and calming him down when he gets fiery. So between him and C.J. Walker still being leadership elements again, assuming Walker stays for now, we don't really know what's going to happen with that either. I only assume he stays because, hey, listen, the upside to not playing this year is he might have an opportunity to put put some uh, film on display in the Big 12 and get some reels out there for his professional future. Mm. That all being said, him and C.J. Walker as a nucleus is a place to start. You got someone in the backcourt, someone in the front court. Now for the rest of it, well, let's just hope Johnny has a good recruiting year. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Ben Stout, actually, uh, I, I got to give uh, credit to Brandon Helwig here. Um uh, Coach Dawkins should have five available scholarships. This is according to Brandon Helwig. Um, so far returning is C.J. Walker, Ithiel Horton, who has one year of eligibility remaining. Mm-hmm. Um, Darius Johnson, Tierno Sila, and Tyler Hendricks, Taylor's younger brother, or not younger brother, uh, twin brother, but shorter brother because he's 6'6". Uh, incoming high school recruits, uh, Joey Hart, um, Kome Emwabor and Petras Patajimas. Uh, forgive me if I pronounce these games, I, these guys incorrectly. You know, I'm going to get that right come basketball season. Yes, he, he hasn't fully studied yet. Let him get to the woods. Yeah, show. listen. Yeah, yeah. I, I got I to gotta actually talk to these dudes. Um, ben Stout, in reply to that, said, you know, one, two, and five right now, by far the biggest positions of need uh, for us. Uh, <clears throat> now, I mean, you still have, I think, you know, three a, a pretty good three headed monster coming back with CJ Ithiel and Darius. You know, I yeah. think you know, assuming that they're all healthy and assuming obviously they all do come back. We haven't had any indication, at least as when we're reporting this, that they're not that any, either any of them are leaving. That's at least something to work with. Okay. And I like having, you know, three experienced guys that you can that you can now that you can count on and build around. Yeah. So yeah. now what do you plug in? You know, I think Ben's right. They do need size. Michael Durr, you know, it struck me as, you know, the guy who, I mean, obviously, what are you going to say about Taylor Hendricks, right? But like <laughs> Michael Durr, you know, we knew he was going to be leaving. Obviously, he only had one year of eligibility left, but they really got to find a guy who can who can fill in that hole. Now, will Tierno Sila fill that hole? I don't know. Um you know, we, we referred to him as the agent of chaos because every time he came in, crazy stuff seemed to happen. And <laughs> a lot of the times it was good. Sometimes it was like, oh, Lord, no, you probably shouldn't take that 30 foot three. Um, <laughs> but uh, but, you know, but that's size that's coming back right now. Do you throw him? Do you throw him out there at the five or do you go get another big body who's more of a rim protector? I think Tierno does have a future as a rim protector because he can jump out the freaking gym. Yeah. But um but you know that that also requ- would require him, I think, to exhibit a level of defensive discipline that we would like to see more of, in order to use several euphemisms at once. Well, so, uh, mostly, yeah, listen, and that's the kind of stuff an off season can bring. I, I don't want to completely true. allow to do you know in that way. I mean, you've made points about other players that if you know they would lock into the gym, not to throw anybody in particular under the bus, but like. If 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 a certain player made it to the gym, you would be stoked about that. For example, that's yeah. come up, you know. Um, but I, I, for my money, despite me saying that, listen, I we live in a world where a seven footer is a good way to lock things up, 
In the past two years, Johnny Dawkins has found a seven-footer that's done that. I would argue that Durr was a better contributor defensively than Chike Banke Jean. But listen, <clears throat> on his first night, dude did, 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 did get to do it to Kempe Mutombo. So there's that. Uh, that seven-footer, I think, is the, def, uh, the, the biggest need for me at the five. And no offense to uh, uh, Silver by any stretch of the imagination. But that, for me, the next big need, in my opinion, is, is a two. You know, mm-hmm. um, a, a backup one, of course, for Darius would be next for me. But, you know, I think I think if he moves fast enough that he could kind of double as a two or a three, especially if they're moving in transition, transition and attacking the basket, because, listen, dude, going Tasmanian devil is a thing. And, and you know, some nights he is, you know, lightning hot in, in a way that even um, used to coach Kelvin Sampson acknowledges. Um mm-hmm. But some nights he's colder than some of the darker nights for, let's say, you old Nick fans and John Stark. So, okay, <laughs> you know, um, so I, I, that's why I like the concept of, you know, plugging him to two or three. If you could get another solid two, if I mean, listen, it, it, CJ Kelly was exactly what the Knights needed in that group last time when the ones were off and the big men had to account for other big men. C.J. Kelly referred to himself as an oversized guard. I prefer to call him an undersized forward. He can move and run things. He, he could definitely do the point forward thing and had a lot of rebounds that people seem – people forget how many rebounds he would contribute at night. Yeah, that's true. All right, so – Kyle, I do have a question about that, actually, hmm. because the Knights do have a couple of players already in-house in guard and I, that I wanted to see what you thought about that. Could Because Michael Kalina, Tyler Hendricks, and Charlie May can redshirt – this offseason and then of course we had a uh, walk on uh poo who had who brought down addition arena multiple times this season <laughs> do you think that any of those four guys could potentially develop into that player that we need or do you think he's gonna johnny dawkins w- will probably find it more in the transfer portal um uh, six of one half a dozen right i i wouldn't rule out for example you know tyler Hendricks being a development project on dawkins list right i mean he, he has the lineage right, right in front of him. This is what could potentially be as a shooter, right? And obviously, he's not 6'10 or 6'11 or, or whatever uh, Taylor was. But at 6'6 and having that gliding body type that can move really well at 6'6, that's not a bad three spot forward that two three guard type so that you're, you're you're pecking at the right tree there that he could develop into that the reason why i'm saying it loosely is i don't know that 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 tyler um has that skill set developed yet we didn't really see him yet so all right um off-season intrigue continues we just saw uh the championship game last night uh monday night starting extraordinarily late uconn won <laughs> Boo. I don't like them at all. One bit. Tell us how you um, really feel. Are you yeah. conflicted? B for B for 2011. It's just, scary. Just just go away. You can. <laughs> you don't need this. So we'll continue to look at that. Well, I'm 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 being I'm trying to be kind here. Hey, I'm just they, left, they left the American for you. What do you can want? you hear the straining in his voice? Um, we do. Anyway. All right. Uh, another another bit of news that popped uh while we were away, and I want to get Drew in on this since he seems to know more about business and stuff than than any than than I do. And so uh, there's been some movement on the NIL front here, uh, specifically. Oh, so UCF had two competing NIL collectives, the Kingdom and Mission Control, um, which have announced that they are now merging. Um, uh, Mission Control is merging into. Uh, the kingdom. <clears throat> um, a couple things on this. Remember, Mission Control was founded by, uh, among others, uh, Mackenzie Milton um, in February 22, uh, powered by Dreamfield, which was, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Drew, that's the, that's the thing that he and Derek King were in on, right? Yeah, and eventually it broke off from Dreamfield. Right, okay. So, uh, and then the kingdom was founded by uh, Tom McNamara with a million dollar pledge, um, and a, and the kingdom actually had the benefit of official recognition by UCF, and so now everything's kind of merged into one. So now, I think this is a story that we're going to follow a little bit more as we head into the off season because 
this is still I personally don't feel like I'm personally like I'm well versed in how all of this really works. Um, in addition to, you know, the fact that, you know, I'm not alone. <laughs> like there's, you know, we're still trying to we're still in the figuring out chaos theory phase of all this. Um, I mean, the universe and, is still figuring it out. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So the universe is still kind of, you know, trying to cool off of this after the Big Bang. But Drew. At least give us a um, sort of a, a an overview of you know why, in your opinion, and based on what you've been able to find out, this this happened. What the true benefit is, and where is the where does the direction of it as as UCF heads into the Big Twelve? Because I, we hear co- you know I hear everybody coaches and analysts and everybody talking about oh nil nil nil, but that but like we don't really know what is actually done by these things so and, and you here. probably won't uh there's a <laughs> I, lot of there's probably a lot of don't back want end, to, there's a lot of backdoor stuff um it's you know it's no different than the days of of giving money in mcdonald's bags it's just there's a little more legal process to it but here, here let, let's let's go back a little bit now you have it's these- a little different <laughs> I, I'm oversimplifying because it sounds funny. Um, it really but, did sound funny, Drew Kluko. But let, let's go back in time. Uh, obviously, mission control came first. And it was actually meant to be aimed for the everyday man. You know, the person who can donate 25 bucks a month, you know, 50 bucks a month. You know, it's, When the kingdom first started, their baseline was 25 grand. Uh, it was meant to be big dollars. So... The moment when the kingdom was formed, I knew it was that the, there was a ticking time bomb of when one of them was going to blow up because UCF does not have the size of developed alumni with money yet to handle to. Uh, you know, UCF has a large alumni base. They're young. The, the generational wealth has not developed yet, which is where these things really excel. So the mission control was perfectly designed for, you know, the everyday person uh, to to feel like they're part of something, meet players, you know, social events. It worked out really well. Uh, the nail in the coffin was when the uh, the rules were changed with NIL and schools were allowed to align themselves with collectives. Once that happened, UCF immediately signed on and endorsed. The kingdom, the kingdom had a lot of money to begin with. Uh, you know, obviously, we all know about the 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 financial contribution the McNamara family has done over the years. John mm-hmm. Uliano got involved. I mean, obviously, he has a baseball stadium named after him. Uh, you know, for the money that he donated to the renovations, I think it was like five mil that he gave to it towards it. Uh, so you already had big dollars backing the kingdom. There was no way mission control is really going to be able to hang with that. So you have two organizations, two sets of overhead that starts becoming wasted money in there. And uh, it, it really became in mission control's best interest to align themselves within the kingdom because the kingdom already had the endorsement of UCF. And UCF was only going to endorse one because there was no reason to endorse two. So it was just it was a matter of time. And so they they worked it out. They basically folded it in, and the kingdom opened the doors to smaller donations, and it's working. So as uh, as we're seeing, and and you know UCF has done their yard sale multiple times over the years. Uh, this year they're doing it differently. They're doing it for the kingdom. So the kingdom is actually uh, the overarching organization I- involved with it. Obviously the school's helping run it, but. The kingdom is the one who's going to get all the benefits. So they actually put in the small print, school employees cannot be involved with the yard sale because mm-hmm. school employees cannot be involved with the collective. Right. Uh, so sorry, Jeff, you can't go. You can't buy from them, but I can't. Interesting. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so what they did, uh, you know, they, they've broken out the the, the yard sale and, and they're doing all that. But the money is all going to the kingdom. So now you have one set uh, of overhead costs. Uh, it's no secret that 
the school and the uh, collective are becoming more aligned. Uh, you know, S.J. Tui left UCF football mm-hmm. and is now uh, the you know the executive director of the collective. Uh, this is by design. Uh, Gus Melzahn has taken a step back, uh, is allowing yeah. uh, Darren Hinshaw to run the offense so he can be more of a CEO. He's going to be uh, working with S.J. on stuff for collaboration to maximize because as 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 you know, Coach Malzahn has said, uh, NIL, which has become kind of a, a, a very a overarching term, it's not about name, image, image, and likeness so much. It's about just paying players. That's what it comes down to. It comes down to paying players. It, there may not be any image and likeness involved, uh, but UCF uh, is definitely behind a lot of other schools on developing. You know, we don't have a billionaire in our pocket like the University of Houston does, you know, yet, and, yet, but I, but we, as, as of right now, I mean, it takes time, it takes time, but as of right now, UCF doesn't have that in their pocket yet. This reminds and, me, I got to buy that Powerball ticket, but anyway, yeah. Uh, hmm. So it's going to take time. It's going to take patience and it's going to take the understanding that with UCF's NIL still, still developing, uh, you know, compared to some of these other schools that just have more money at their expose at, at their disposal, they're going to lose out on some of these battles, on these recruiting battles. Uh, it may not be like, oh, they chose X school because they didn't like it. No, X school giving them more money than UCF can afford to do at this point. And um, I don't remember uh, um, the was it John Darrell was uh, the the player from from FAU who just said, I just want to feed my family. It, they're going to be looking very carefully at where their maximum value can be. That's why the transfer portal is so valuable because the tra- by the time you're in for a year or so, you can you can recruit a different way. You don't have to just flash uh, a you know hundred dollars and and get someone to to sign on. You actually can sell them more on on what your program is about. Kids that, that's okay. Money. You brought up an interesting point right there which is value, right? I think that a lot of the big headlines, and this is the last question I want to have about it before, before we go to break and we'll get to Ryan Sabota after this, but um, the, the part, that's the part that I, as a fan look at and I'm like, okay, what really, you know, what is the value? Cause we hear all the time on ESPN and some of the recruiting services. Okay. You know, like Miami was throwing an ungodly amount of money yet some football recruit, I forget who it was. Maybe you guys remember the name, but, um, you know, there were, or, or uh, Alabama or Oklahoma. Are you talking about the, uh, the Florida incident with the quarterback? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah, the 13. <laughs> okay, like, at some point, you know, this is why I think we're still in the chaos theory phase. Like, at some point, even the donors are going to look at that and be like, is that worth it? Like, well, it is, thir- is thirteen million dollars, for example, to a high school recruit really? It wasn't real. That was the thing. It wasn't real, right? Yeah, and um, and, and and so that's where that's where I kind of look at. It. I'm like, you know, where's where's the equilibrium point with this? Well, here, here's the scary part. We know that offer wasn't real. Uh, I mean, it was it was really given, but the dollars were never there to do it. Hmm. Uh, the kid signed and, and had to get out of the uh, out of his uh, his letter uh, because the you know there was a bait and switch essentially. I mean, there was uh, definitely a breach of contract, right, Drew? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, and, and see, they can make the the argument of there was no breach of contract because the school and the collective are still separate entities. Uh, this is where this is where. Uh, the gotcha gets gets you. The school yeah. does not have to let you out of your hand, hand, letter. Handshake agreements aren't on paper, man. Yeah, no, the, true. You know, if the kingdom says we're going to give you X amount of dollars and you sign to UCF and then they back out, UCF didn't do anything wrong. They're not part of the kingdom, nor are they just you know uh, endorse them. By the way, but that's the it. Definition of bad faith. Not, not by the way, nothing. Oh, you're totally saying bad faith. Yeah. Total bad faith. Uh, yeah. uh, you know. You know, I, I work in an industry where it's all about ha- being fully capitalized 
to be able to handle commitments. Uh, if you don't have the money or the surplus involved within a certain ratio, you can't get involved. Uh, there's requirements. So in this case, they basically leaked before they looked and made sure that the dollars were even closely accounted for. Uh, th this was just a disaster on, on multiple occasions. Uh, but it's a great case study in the dangers of collectives just saying whatever. Them get, acting get, like timeshares, essentially. Get, yeah. get the sale. So this get is why sale. we're starting to see the push for legislation about this, right, Drew? Well, the NCAA wants Congress to help unify. Uh, it's, if, if there's one thing the NCAA is actually trying to do right, I think this is one of the things that they're trying. Now, how they're doing it, mm, but but they want <laughs> they want the 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 rules to be unified. Uh, the pay for play is starting to get a little out of hand, which was never never the intention of NIL, but you knew it was going to come. Give, well, give them an inch, you take a mile, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're well, asking for help. Business. Because they don't have the teeth to do it themselves. Uh, do I think they'll get it? I don't know. Uh, they keep, they seem to find ways to fall on their face time and time again and lose the faith of those. Who, that the NCAA help. or Congress? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, we're still waiting on daylight saving time to become a thing. Oh, boy. Here we go. Uh, and that's been it's how many years now? for another time. Yeah. How many years? But uh, I digress. Uh mm -hmm. They, they're looking for help. I don't know if they'll get it, but obviously this is not a sustainable model. Something's going to break. And we saw a, a crack at what happened at the University of Florida with their collective. Uh, now, granted, you know, you talk, you, you mentioned Miami. My, obviously Miami had their gotten their own hot water with the recruitment of, of the, the transfer of those uh, two women's basketball players, uh, the mm -hmm. sisters. Uh, but John the Ruiz, went after them too. That was, oh yeah, and they they got slapped on the, they, the they Cavender got, twins. Yeah, they got you know a slap on the wrist over it. Uh, but yeah, you know, just something something very small. But it's the first time the NCAA made a move on something nil related. So it, it, it's the it's the slight opening of the door for the possibility of actually enforcing rules and managing this because I, as we know, it's the wild west out there. And, and and everyone's emboldened just to throw money. Yeah. Get the guy, get the guy, make the sale, get the guy. Uh, so we are far from done as far as the evolution of this process. But I think in UCF's case, it's good that they've created a singular collective as opposed to having two. I would be surprised one day if they eventually get banned altogether because of the stuff that we're seeing. But that's not going to happen. Did NIL soon. collectives get banned? I, I think eventually they could. Um, because oh, I don't know. I, you're seeing I, a lot I feel of like, I feel there's like a lot of dirty money involved. There's a lot of dirty money involved. I, I, I get that, but I think I think you can't unring that bell. I would, yeah, I'm with Jeff. Now, I think that somewhere in the middle that they're going to utilize them to leverage the regulation. It's the right. pay to play problem. You got to do something for the pay to play plot problem. Right. Uh, like you, you may have a situation where you know players are, you know, for example, players cannot sign contracts for specific values unless the nil actually has that unless the collective actually has that money on board um you know i feel like there would be you know you could have a situation where a collective would you know you could see a situation where they could pool money and then distribute that out evenly among the uh, among players um there's a number of different ways that that can go the more i think about it i I, I just I, I'm just genuinely curious about it because it feels like there's like a whole lot going on, but it's like what's the real brass tax here? And it, and my hope is that we'll have some guests on um, here on the Night Shift podcast. I've said it again uh, to to sort of clear out the fog a little bit and help us to understand it a little bit more. So um, that's my objective, at least as of right now. Stick around because you know we're going to be covering this, I think, a little bit more because it, it is a really big thing. It's something that you know, we hear these terms throwing around, but it's kind of like, you know, cold fusion and everyone know you know, it, but no one really understands what that is. Right. You know, it's like, do, do you, okay. Can you explain cold fusion? It's like, Oh, it's it, it, Dr. Octopus. You know, it, it's, I would argue cold fusion's easier to understand than these collectives, but I digress. Yeah. You're spoken like a true it guy, but anyway, <laughs> um, all right. Uh, we're going to take a quick little breather. When we come back, Ryan Sabota joins us 
on the Night Shift Podcast. Kyle Nash talked to him to uh, to talk about his time at UCF and uh, and going uh, preparing for the NFL and the NFL draft coming up uh, later this month. And uh, some talk about, and this is the part that I really like about it, is a little uh, talk, a little shop talk about the big fellas up front. Oh yes, yes. what that means for it, for everybody to to understand how football is played in the year 2023. So stick around. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to the Night Shift Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Kyle Nash with you. Bryson Turner, Nick Porcelli waiting in the wings on deck, uh, waiting to hop in. But I wanted to, but this uh, week we wanted to talk a little football. The NFL draft is coming up later this month. Uh, we had UCF Pro Day mm-hmm. uh, over the past couple of weeks, Kyle Nash. And one of the guys participating in that is Ryan Soboda. Of course, Ryan was a, a transfer over from UVA. Is that right? If, if, right. If, if I, if, yeah, if I if I remember correctly, uh, along with RJ Harvey, interestingly enough. Yes. Um, but Ryan, of course, big fella, six ten up front, uh, and uh, gave it. And you hooked up with him, Kyle, to get to get a little insight on the pro day draft preparation process that UCF puts its players through. There's been a little bit of news on that as well. Um, the Big Twelve actually. Uh, is discussing the idea of having a combined pro day for all of its schools. Essentially, a, a makes it basically a Big Twelve draft yeah. combine, which right. I think is actually a, a cool idea. Combine. Well, yeah, a conference combine. You and um, I can dish up on a, on why that's a bad plan on another podcast, but yeah, you think it's a bad plan? I do. I think it has some negatives that people aren't thinking about. Interesting. Well, I mean, I, well, I, I want to hear about that, but I want to hear about it on the other end of. You're talking about, but, but but give us a little preview of what you talk with Ryan, and we'll go to the interview. Yeah, you know, and it's funny. I, I, I ran, of course, into some of the guys. By the way, side note, uh, at Pro Day, Anthony Montalvo looked even leaner after since like just since the Hula Bowl. He's like looking bigger up top. He's getting ready to try to wear an NFL frame. Very interesting. Um, everybody looked really good in the Pro Day who participated that I saw. Um, and of course, I talked to Coach Coach Hand. Going in, uh, going into meeting up with Ryan in the scrum, and and during his, um, during that conversation with the the media there, um, he had mentioned the Zach Martin Foundation and awareness surround, you know, preventing, um, heat heat exhaustion with athletes, which you know is something that isn't a a prominent problem in the sense that it's preventable, but it's still happening even though it's preventable in some places. So this foundation works to make sure that certain athletic programs and things like that have that happen. Um, he himself suffered uh, from heat exhaustion at one point to a major level. And and so it's uh, something that's close to him and, you know, something I, I don't know that I've talked with you guys about, but um, from my semi-pro time there, you see my jersey behind me here on the wall. If you have the video, uh, one of the players I played with also too, after, after that um, passed away as well, from heat, uh, heat heat exhaustion. So, you know, when he talked about the Zach Martin Foundation and his involvement with that, you know, I kind of pulled him aside and said, Hey, this has touched me too. Let's let's talk about it. And then, you know, as two as two members of the 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 collective of beef, so to speak, um, you know, we got to talk and shop about other things. So, you know, it was a good time all the way around. All right. So let's go ahead and listen in Kyle Nash's discussion with UCF graduated UCF offensive tackle. Ryan Subota. And welcome once again. This is Kyle Nash, the student of the game here. And on behalf of the black and gold banneret this time around, and of course, very special opportunity. It's not every time I get to talk to a player, let alone a fellow member of the beef. Like we talked to uh, uh, Cole Schneider last year. I almost called him Corey Schneider. No, Cole Schneider last year. We got another prospect coming out here who's on the O-line, a very talented man of the beef, a conference tackle, if I remember correctly. Ryan Swoboda, what's going on, man? What's up? Yeah, I'm doing good. I appreciate you having me on. I am a proud member of the beef, just like you said. As the man gets yeah, it. I didn't know, but yeah, I'll take it. See, it, it, you, you're uniquely qualified for this. Like, when I talk about the fat guys, people will say to me now, like, Kyle, you've lost 40 pounds. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's our word. You can't use the F word like that, okay? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. We, we claim that word. <laughs> anyway, so let's, you know, and, and, and we're having fun, but I want to get into it quickly, like the whole impetus for this conversation. Like, not that I would have 
look forward to talking to you anyway. But you said this, and I had to seek you out afterward. We were in the stand-up uh, scrum presser after pro day where you did a fantastic job. We'll talk about how you defy physics being 6'10 and moving a certain way that you did, like because that's a conversation I need to have with you. But um, you had mentioned the Zach Martin Foundation. And um, you had mentioned, you know, listen, players who take a platform – any entertainer for that moment who, who, who take a platform and, and for something positive. This is one that touched me uniquely rather than rattle on. I'll let you talk about it. The Zach Martin foundation. Tell us a little bit about it, buddy. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. First of all, after that press conference, finding me, talking to me a little bit, sharing uh, your story a little. So that was really cool. Um, but yeah, the Zach Martin foundation, I had been um, real close to them for a while. Um, they've been coming to my game since 20, uh, maybe 2020 or 2021. When I was at Virginia, they'd come to um, some away games and stuff like that. So um, they're a great family, a wonderful family. Zach Martin's a football player, high school football player, not the guard for the Cowboys. He's an offensive lineman. Um, he passed away from a heat stroke um, in high, playing high school football. Um, it's, you know, horrible tragedy. Um, so his parents started the Zach Martin Foundation to prevent tragedies like this from happening again in the future. Um, it hit so close to me because in 2017, my life and my football career was put in jeopardy due to a heat stroke. I had a core temperature of 109. Um, a heat stroke is anything above 104. Um, just, I was in the hospital for three weeks. Um, I couldn't play football, do anything football related for over a year. Um, but I'm, I'm extremely lucky to still be here. So when I see people who uh, are affected by heat strokes this way and people who have died of a heat stroke, um, it's a tragedy because it's 100% preventable. Um, so I want to do everything in my power to help the Zach Martin Foundation's mission of making sports a much safer place. So um, we did this fundraiser. We got a ton of support, a ton of money. Um, it's still open. It'll be open for, I believe, five or six more days. Um, I'm overwhelmed with, with the support and the donations and everything. Um, the, U the UCF family has really um, helped out, and, and they're making football and all sports safer in the state of Florida right now. Um, but I want to do everything I could for the Zach Martin Foundation um, just to help them continue their mission. Um, it's kind of it's kind of what I want to do. It's kind of my why, why I want to keep doing this because um, playing football is great. I love football. I've done it for just about my whole life. But if I can play football and also use whatever platform I've uh, developed to make it a better sport, to make the world better, even if it's, you know, just saving a couple of lives. That's, that's unbelievable because heat strokes, there aren't this thing where, you know, you're seeing thousands of people dying of it, but if something is completely preventable, death is completely out of the question. It's not like, well, you have a 90% chance. It is 100% chance of survival, no long-term anything. You're good. Just based on spreading awareness and being prepared. Why would you not do everything you can to prevent that? Because nobody should be at risk of any kind of death playing the sport that they love, especially at the high school level. Um, sports are one of the greatest things we have in the world. And um, if I can help the Zach Martin Foundation make them safer, that's that's unbelievable. Um, I think there's a segment on CBS tonight um, airing a little bit about it. So that'll get a little bit of, um, of love. But, you know, I want to take every opportunity I can to say, first of all, thank you for everybody who has talked to me about it, who has donated. I want to thank you for getting me on the podcast, letting me get on my soapbox one more time and talk about it. Um, the sport's been un unbelievable and um, I want to keep going on the journey to make this sport as safe as possible and, you know, prevent anything that happened to me to happen to this family from ever happening again. Yeah. And, and uh, as we're pre-recording this, that special may have already aired, but I'm going to find the name of it and put it in uh, part of the, the, the caption or whatever, so they can go back and find it on demand and check that out because you have definitely uh, peaked my interest on that for sure. And, and listen, you mentioned, uh, I, I'm going to have some questions for you a minute too, because there's some stuff I just thought of surrounding your story. I'll, I'll have some answers, I promise. <laughs> my man. See, the glasses aren't just a show. He's intelligent, ladies and gentlemen. They're actually, there's no prescription. It's just a pure fashion statement. Little known fact. How about that? See, there you go. We're behind the curtain for what Ryan Scoop over here. I don't, here I don't think I've ever shared that with anybody. That's my deepest, darkest secret. So oh, look at this. You. Scoop. No, <laughs> but um, yeah. A little bit about my story, too. Like when I played semi-pro ball, you know, as is depicted behind me here in my Aaron Evans original, for those that see the uh, video, um, the um, 
the 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 part for me like it wasn't me personally but a guy who started at left guard and when i played i played right next to him i played next to him a lot in practice too you know filling in all that uh, his name was will huzzy and and you know he and i played together we won the championship at the southern states football league um playing here in orlando but then he went on to play juco ball which he was all he talked about on road games is you know how he's going to catch on get a scholarship play juco ball and build his way up and and he had gotten into a juco college and and he was in practice you know living through his dream and living out his plan and then one day in camp he collapsed and didn't essentially really ever wake back up unfortunately so you know you told that story and i think the part that what's that buddy unbelievable yeah. yeah yeah and the part that about it is it's completely preventable and it, it all stems from what is proven to be now a completely obsolete train of thought of like well you know you don't need water we got to be tough you know and and yeah. like but it's water you know yeah. you need water oh, to i want to mention first of all Please. yeah in the last i don't know how many years but football now and sports now they do a great job of water yes. breaks and, and being smart and, and incorporating sports science into the sport. So with everything that I believe, so now I'm talking about my personal belief, football is one of the greatest sports because it challenges you to get to that state of where your mind wants to quit and your body feels like it can't go no more. <clears throat> and you got to push past that point. You know, if you play, yes. right. So you know how to push past that point. Um, and so everything I want to do in regards to preventing heat strokes, I don't want to tell coaches, man, you know, well, you better give them more off days, man, you better, you know, take it easy on these guys. I do not want that. I want coaches to do everything they feel comfortable doing. And I just want the coaches to feel prepared, the, st the players to feel prepared, trainers to feel prepared to handle any circumstance that happens. If you look at the NFL, the only person ever dying on an NFL field was from a heat stroke. It's Corey Stringer, and I believe it's 2001. Very good. Um, yes. You know, and, and you look at concussions, there are so many protocols, as there should be, because concussions are a major problem. And you have all these protocols and preparation, you know how to handle it. Nobody has ever died of a concussion on a field. Concussions, there should be all the protocols and probably more in regard to them. But somebody has died of a heat stroke, and there are not similar protocols. Um, so that, that that's what it's all about. So just having those protocols prepared, having life-saving equipment ready to go. And if you do that, no matter what happens on the field, you are prepared and, you know, nobody will die and nobody will really be injured either. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that. No, that's great. If you didn't bring up Corey Stringer, I would have, man. So that's very good that you brought that in. And, and I'll see that. I love your point about the protocols for concussions and things like that kind of being similar. And I think I think the main thing that 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 needs to be stressed is we're still kind of figuring out the CTE science and what's going on in the brain and things like that. The um heat stroke what's causing that what's going on there is a known quantity so they can be prepared for it just like you're talking about so i i definitely support that and hey listen somebody who's wa who's walking the talk of player safety right here with ryan Svoboda, man that's what it is i i can't add i can't add any more shine on it than that my friend but yeah now, now that we've talked a little bit about your story i'm curious about this now you've kind of knocked something loose in my head obviously uh you transferred from Virginia um, used to play for the ACC. My apologies for the, all the times I've been critical of that conference, but uh, <laughs> but with that in mind, it's not your fault. It's FSU's. But with that in mind, um, I, I, I you're when you're looking to transfer and having experience what you did with heat stroke, were you kind of mindful of that when you were like, "Hey, I'm going to go to Florida to yeah. play football next"? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll mention I'm undefeated against FSU, so there's no. <laughs> um yeah there there were um people that had mentioned me you know like you're going to the hottest most humid place i grew up in florida i grew up in orlando um that played a factor in me wanting to come back but um there had been so much monitoring because um it's there's no real protocol of returning to play after my heat stroke and my experience so when they returned me to play they they were really cautious liability reasons right so Right. Um, I would take a pill. It's like that big, right? And I, every morning I'd take this pill, um, and it was a, like a Bluetooth pill. So on their phones, they could come up to me, and they could see in real time my core temperature. 
based based on that pill, right? Oh, it was so thick it had a sensor or something in it, right? Yeah, it's a sensor. They they like use it like when NASA astronauts would take it when they go in space and they can track them. But yeah, I would take one every day. They're like twenty five dollars a pop. So you know that adds up because I take one every single day. Yeah, I mean per I mean I used to work I I used to work in specialty pharmacy per pill. It yeah. could be worse, but that still adds up if you, especially if you happen to be, you know, a college athlete. You know, that's right. not a simple thing to swallow. You'll pardon the pun. I warned you about dad jokes on the show, Ryan Swoboda. You did, I, and I still wasn't prepared for that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I take the, this pill, and they would monitor in real time. And at first, you know, my my um, temperature would fluctuate, but you know, I kind of it helped me learn my body because I'm talking every ten minutes. They would come up and be like, "Okay, ninety nine point four." You know, okay, 101.4, how are you feeling? You know what I mean? And I got so good because that's every day I'm doing that to where I could guess pretty much within like 0.3 or 0.4 oh, wow. of my temperature in real time. Because I'd start going to my mess around and be like, you know, I'm pretty tired, probably like 100.3. I'm like, yeah, 100.5, you know? And I got pretty good. So, you know, that was good for me just to learn my body. Um, and I told the trainers here, I said, look, if I ever get to a point where I feel like, man, I am not feeling good. Um, I'm, I'm hopping out like I am. Um, I, you know, I'm a six year senior at the time. I played five years of college football. Mm-hmm. I would do that, but I put myself in a position to where I trained so hard on my own time that I knew when it was time to go in camp that I would never be in that position where I felt like my body temperature was raising. Um, and I haven't felt like that in a long time. I feel like, you know, I keep myself in good shape and um, I know my body well enough that. I'll be able to communicate that. So with my own personal um, feelings about coming down to Florida, you know, it's kind of a challenge doing fall camp and spring ball in the heat, but um, it was good for me. And um, it did not play a factor in deciding whether or whether not to come to UCF. I, there you go. And and Hey, listen, by the way, any uh, scouts out there, hint, hint, that's intelligence and responsibility demonstrated here in this interview with Ryan Svoboda. Make a note. Yeah, man. Make a note. Cool. (laughs) So, um, you know, with that in mind, let, let me transition to this, too, because the 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 first time I spoke to you was in a press conference, uh, one of the Monday press conferences. You know, coach usually goes first. It was after uh, the Cincinnati game. And throughout the year, you know, I had I had pointed out things with the offensive line about how you guys had so many people coming in. You were one of a, a number of transfers. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and and but that game, I felt like was where you all locked in um, best. And then you had told me you hadn't played your best football. Now, the reason why I'm going with that is the uh, you had said after the pro day that your favorite moment of the year was the R.J. Harvey touchdown to win that Cincinnati game. Um, what about that particular moment makes it kind of the pinnacle for you uh, during that particular season or this past particular season? Yeah, I wouldn't call it the pinnacle. I, it was my favorite moment, you know. I guess it's something, point, but yeah. something about the word pinnacle. I don't know, but no, no, no. Hey, that's a good check. As somebody who's a wordsmith, that was irresponsible use by me. Good call out. I'm with it. Yeah. Um, no, I, that was my favorite moment. So, first of all, it's my favorite play: backside block of inside zone. Um, I'll go into something personal with me before I go into, you know, how awesome that play was because RJ made that play happen. He made that play. Same with Akai, right guard. He. Mm-hmm. Um, he did a great job. They shot the linebacker in the A gap. He did a great job picking that up. He made the cutback lane. But um, for myself, when I transferred, I'm coming from a, a pass heavy offense at Virginia. We threw the ball a ton, and I wanted to go somewhere a little bit different. I wanted to run the ball more, you know, add to a different part of my game. So in spring ball, one of the things that I never really mastered was backside inside zone and the intricacies of that. Um, and it, it, it's hard, you know, different footwork, understanding, um, linebacker, leverage and stuff. I just never lived in that world. Um, so I felt like I got better on that's kind of what I focus on the most with backside of inside zone. And we got really good at it, Wakai and I. Um, so here we go. We're playing uh, Cincinnati, stress to the max, right? I think we're down at that point. Um, we just got this big first down. Okay, we're going to run the ball, try and get the clock down. And, you know, then we can take a shot at the end zone. And we're running inside zone to the left, which means we had a three technique. Um, and if you go watch the play again, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the, the three technique. Um, he was first team all conference. And the linebacker on that side is uh, even pace or uh, pace. He's a uh, 
first team all conference linebacker, heck of a play, both of them, right? Pace so has a shot at the NFL himself, by the way, as a side. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So they had two first team all conference, and then I had Lakai to my left, Lakai's first team all conference, and myself a first team all conference. The double team is us two for those two. That's that's inside zone, backside, the way that that works. Um, you can't get that kind of a matchup in an MMA fight. I'm a, I'm exactly. a hard so it. it was just heavyweight on heavyweight. So Lakai takes a step, gets under um, Juwan the three technique. Um, Juwan's a strong dude, really, really good player, right? Gets underneath, linebacker shoots a gap, has the foot quickness to go pop, pop, get under the three technique, pop off. You can go watch the play. It, it, it's unreal. Pop, pop, gets on the linebacker, covers him up. We get good movement on the double team, um, gets some push. Alec Huller comes in, cuts off the defensive end, which was one of the hardest blocks for a tight end to make. Absolutely. RJ goes, you know, infamous spin move right there. You know, we're thinking, let's get five yards, run this clock down so Cincinnati doesn't have a shot at it. And we just gash on my favorite play, something that at first I had struggled with. And um, now I feel like it's one of my strong suits is that B block double team on the backside. So um, gash on RJ hits that spin move, touchdown, win the game. Um, can't get better than that. No, hey, listen, there's, first of all, there's a lot of juicy there for those of us yeah. that enjoy the beef. Yeah. Uh, see, there's more of that word. A lot of, a lot of beef. Oh, yeah. Um, but, and, and here's the part that's unique. And I don't know that every single, you know, UCF fan might understand this. I'm unique, uniquely qualified too, because when I played, I was a waist bender and just being at six, five, that was a problem. Yeah. You, my friend could pass for an NBA power forward at your height yeah. at six ten, And here you have a six eleven guy. I was talking to, uh, uh, coach hand, Herb hand mm -hmm. at pro day. And I finally, I didn't, I, I haven't had an opportunity to get him one-on-one -on -one before either, but I pulled him aside and said, coach, I'm an inquiring mind. I got to know how on earth did you get this guy right? Especially when you're, you know, you're telling us here, you're trying to craft your run blocking, mm -hmm. right? How, how, how did you get that right coach? So I'm going to say a term to you that you probably know, thanks to that. And yeah. have you explain your interpretation. He says he worked on your body demeanor. Body demeanor. So. <laughs> That is a really nice way of saying I had him hold, um, what is this thing called? It's this heavy bar. So it makes sure that your angles go like this. So basically, if you can see my lats, when you're blocking, you don't want to be like this. You want your lats engaged, right? That's what so, I say, thumbs up. Right? So who's listening on the pod real quick, it's, it's about having your hands out in front of your chest. But instead of like you were showing me your fingers up, you want your thumbs up. And so this is you could get proper hold on the on the pads of whoever you're blocking, right? Exactly. Yeah, you don't want your elbows out. You want your lats engaged, thumbs up. So this is bad. This is good, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm holding this bar that makes sure your hands stay there, and it's heavy, and it makes sure you engage everything, right? Sitting real low, and basically Coach Han just makes you sit there. It's like 95 degrees. It's hot outside. It's spring ball, and just change direction. And you, what you want to see is your body demeanor. If your hip levels rise as you fatigue. It's no good, right? Because right. you're in the third or fourth quarter, you're going to be fatigued. So you want to be able to have your body continue having that same consistent low hip level. So his way of saying, "Oh, I worked on his body demeanor," that could be that could just be, "Yeah, we put him under a sled in the heat and made him hold this bar and stay really low for a long time to where his legs were shaking, so that you got so comfortable being in that position." So yes, uh, Coach Han did a great job working on body demeanor with me. So to kind of translate for people who are outside the trenches, like if you've ever done planks, how your abs feel is how he felt in his uh, <laughs> upper or, or not. It's not quite your quad everywhere. Yeah, yeah, just just the general lower body area. That's, Let's a, that's a great analogy. Yeah, it's it's a plank of the lower body. Yeah, a lower body plank, uh, vertical, of course, right? So gravity is actually working against you even more. Because there's more. See, we're getting science up in this beast. Right. So, no, look, offensive line play is like is like a martial art. You know what I mean? All offensive linemen kind of. Yeah, yeah. See, we speak the same language. Oh, hey, I've um, used this analogy, but continue. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you my version when you get Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, everybody, you, you got something familiar. You're all friends. You all experience something that nobody else can experience. So you all have some kind of a like mind. You have this movement that looks kind of unnatural, like a kick step. This is yep. the most unnatural movement ever. You're hey, telling me I'm supposed to kick back seven yards to a guy standing right there who is faster than me, sprinting forward, and I'm supposed to beat him to a spot going backwards. 
all at which this guy's probably 285 pounds can turn it into a borish and I have to stop that on a dime. Mm-hmm. That's hard to do. So that's why it's like a martial art, a kick step. You got to master that, um, that ability. So yeah, great analogy. And oh, by the way, the taller you are, the harder that ish is, right? More science, you know. I will disagree, but oh, okay, you know. no, please, please. No, no. You know, you got you got the long arms. If you can bend, you can play. If I'm six foot three and I'm stiff in the hips and I'm standing up and I'm letting a guy get under me, so be it. Um, if I'm six foot ten, but I have good body demeanor, right? It does not matter. I mean, if if everything was of, and I mean. This is an argument very common among uncle linemen. Some people are like, man, I, well, I'll just take a guy who's 6'2 with long arms and I get the best of both worlds. I don't subscribe to that, that school of thought. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a an, uh, common debate, though. But if that was the truth, all the best D linemen would be 5'7, you know? <laughs> I love it. And then what? You know, there would be no, no market for a 6'4 defensive tackle. And if you look in the NFL, there's quite the market. So. That's listen, that's a that's a great comeback. By the way, we can kill all of this too with understanding that a large portion of it is the player's personality demeanor as well. Like as intelligent and as nice a guy as you are, listen, I had an intelligent and nice conversation with Indomitian Sue when I was in uh, the Super Bowl in Phoenix. I don't want to play him either. So, right, right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's it, and 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 the way Coach Hand put it is he had to learn to teach without thinking about pad level is what he said to me. So there you an opportunity. I'll add, I'll add one more thing. Yeah, talking about pad level, um, I would I would get into um, not what's the word? Not a debate because when you're a player, you don't debate your coach, right? You learn from your coach and, and you talk and you learn from each other. So I would always look at a play. So let's say this is my helmet, right? Right. And this is a D lineman and we're, we're blocking each other. My helmet's right here. My pad level is higher than his, right? My helmet level is higher than his, but it, I look at it more where my hands are. If my hands are under right. his hands, that's where I'm at. So if my head's here and his head's here, but I take my hands and my hands are here and his hands are going straight here. I'm lower than him. Right. Even so wh- whoever can see the video real quick, Ryan, like just right. because your head and shoulders might be above his, if your level where we're with where you're at again, you know, we were talking earlier about where you're holding that bar, right? If you got your hands inside your thumbs up and you're under where his hands are and you're able to drive into his chest, exactly. it's still over. I don't care. Exactly. And because you're tall, that's very possible. You know, exactly. Yeah. Hand level, I think is more valuable than pad level. That's another opinion I hold that not everybody holds, but I think that's what it's all about is your hand level. There's so many things, man. Listen, I can make the whole damn hour on this, and I'm not trying to keep you an entire hour. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, this is this is a great dive into it. But let's go into another topic that's uniquely qualified uh, to be talked about by offensive linemen such as ourselves, um, but also is more relatable to the casual public, air quotes. Um, you talked about a special celebration you were going to execute after Pro Day, so I have to know, what flavor milkshake was it? Here you go. I took a picture. Oh no, it's real. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, amazing. Really, really good. There's me right after with my Chick fil A milkshake. Nice. It was delicious, but I was a little disappointed. Not with the product. The product was phenomenal. I enjoyed every second of it. But I go up to the window and I say, they're like, what do you want? I say, I just want one milkshake. I say, cookies and cream milkshake. They're like, that's it. I was like, that's it. Just give me a milkshake. They didn't ask me what size, small, medium, or large. And I was like, okay, well, they must have just seen me and assumed they could give me the large. I'm cool with it. So I go up to the window, and the thing is pretty small. And I guess they only do one size. I haven't been I haven't been plugged into Chick-fil-A no more. So they only got one size. So, you know, I finished it before I even gotten home. It was awesome. No yeah. hate to Chick-fil-A. Love Chick-fil-A. The product was phenomenal. But, I, you know, when I was doing that press conference, I remember I even rubbed my hands. I was thinking about this this milkshake. I was thinking of a, you know, a real heaping milkshake, but, you know, can't win them all. I enjoyed it. But, you know, as of today, back on the grind. So no more milkshakes. Here's what it is. The day you get the announcement that you're going to the NFL, what you're going to do instead, you're going to go to Dairy Queen. You're going to get that at large blizzard and take. I'll let you know specifically if it's better than the Chick-fil-A cookies and cream. I got you. (laughs) Hey, listen. Yeah, compa- see, comparing two link things like that to me is a losing battle. Why close doors? Okay, they both can be great. 
They can both be great. It's like it's like MJ and LeBron, you know. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate like some that. greatness. Um, take me to the NFL PA Bowl, man. Because listen, the the we've had, of course, we had the Hula Bowl right here in our backyard, which is all interesting. The Shrine Bowl leaves Florida, goes to Hawaii. The NFL PA Bowl leaves Hawaii, or excuse me, the Hula Bowl leaves Hawaii, comes here. You know, we had the local elements here, but you went to the NFL PA Bowl. I I have I have worked with writers that have covered it. I've not done it personally because let's be honest, to jump to California is definitely a budget conversation with the wife. But um, um, tell me about that experience a little bit, and and you know what sort of stuff, uh, what what you kind of experienced, you know, playing with other guys, and some stuff you might have learned, some stuff you might have showed on film for scouts that haven't seen it yet, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I wanted to play in the Hula Bowl um, as well, you know, but I ultimately chose the PA game. Mm-hmm. Um, I had gotten hurt um, in the first practice in the PA game. I had an ankle injury that I had played through the season that I re-aggravated at the first practice. So, you know, I kind of grinded through one more practice. I was playing left tackle, which I played right tackle. If I want to go to the NFL, got to do both, right? So yes, sir. Um, I told him, I said, you know, I'll do I'll do left tackle. Um, I, I worked on it for about three weeks. Um, and when you do a position change, all your, you'll know about this, your body mechanics will change. So you're kind of at risk for injury at first, which kind of, I guess, why I re- re-aggravated my ankle, um, mm-hmm. ballooned up. Wasn't able to really perform or play um, in the game. So, you know, that side, not great. Everything else, though, the PA game, you know, they did a really good job. Um, Andrew Whitworth, he talked to um, to us. and Oh, he's um, great. Really, really, really smart guy. I aspire to carry myself with a similar demeanor as him one day. Um, Ronnie Stanley as well, he, he talked with us. Um, one thing that really stuck with me about uh, Whitworth, is he was mentioning that um, before games, because um, as an old lineman, you have ebbs and flows. You have the game you rush for 300 yards, and everybody's loving the quarterback and the the running back. And then you have the games that you lose by a touchdown, and everybody's saying, well, the old line sucks. They gave up two sacks. We <laughs> hate them. But there are ebbs and flows, right? And as an old lineman, you can't get up and down on yourself. So you just got to stay calm. So what Whitworth told us is he said, he would at first get really high and really low. He said if he was going out the tunnel before a game, crowds going crazy, real loud, ready to go, he said if he could just roll his shoulders back and yawn, he knew it would be a great game because he was that calm. I can't even comprehend getting ready to run out the tunnel and yawning. But that's what he said. He's like, if I could just yawn, I've done my training, I've done what I do, he's ready to go. That, um, you know, that's insightful. That's something that I learned that I'm like, it's, it's, it's true because if you get, if you get real high and real low, you're not going to be a very good alignment. You, you get one holding penalty, you're going to spiral out of control. Mm. So that was a valuable thing that I learned. There are, you know, the PA game, a lot of like NFL guys are there just because it's the NFL PA. I was um walking and I'm looking at this guy and I, I was like, is that Richard Sherman? <laughs> what am I doing here? Yeah. So it was really cool. It's um, funny, in 14, when the NLP, NFLPA had their meetings here in Orlando, I interviewed both Whitworth and Sherman. That's pure serendipity. I love that. Yeah, yeah. That's, funny. that's crazy. Yeah. But, um, no, I, I I like that. By the way, that yawning tip, mm-hmm. uh, first of all, you getting that from Whitworth is is not a shock because even back in, in 14, he's not certainly not a 40-year-old, you know, back then, still was a smarter guy back when he was playing for the Bengals. Um, yeah. But that yawning technique, I might even adopt that for you know some office meetings coming up, man, because some of them can get intense in their own right. Yeah, That's fun yeah, for sure. sure. So yeah. good tip in general. Um, take me to this because we talked earlier about you got you guys there up front having to gel throughout the season, got a lot of transfers and things like that. I I, I kind of asked um Lokahi about this. Lokahi Bayoli, of course, the guard who's coming back this year. Really looking forward to see what he uh, uh not that he did didn't bring anything last year, but I'm looking to see his evolution. That'll be entertaining to watch for any UCF football fan. But um what sort of tips or what would you kind of ask fans to look for at watching a group that's trying to gel and, and the sort of signs that it's starting to happen? So I could talk for about three hours of all of my pet peeves of you know fans go god just blocked oh my god he ran right around him that's the one that gets me and i just want to go if they understood you know the dynamics of six man and five man pass protection 
Mm-hmm. And going, well, you know that tackle has to sift between the Mike and the Sam. By the way, the corners press with the safety off the hash, which, by the way, this guy is six foot six, two hundred eighty-five pounds, and runs a four-four. Which, by the way, they just twisted a T twist three times. So I better set more vertical and have my inside hand going right. And then the guy runs a, a speed rush after he's bull rush four straight times. And you're still looking at the Sam linebacker thinking, well, he is kind of out leveraging the defensive end a little bit. And the fan goes, God, this tackle sucks. He ran right around him. And I just want to go, well, it's pretty darn hard to, I'll give that guy a break. Um, but no, that that's, that's football. Um, I don't even know what the question was. I just, no, no, but, <laughs> but, but I mean, um, you spoke to it quite a bit. Some of the challenges connected to, to having a line gel. First of all, you got to get your assignments in a new um, environment, right? Yeah. And you're mentioning yourself, like you were here, you worked with Coach Malzahn to sharpen your run game, which, right. I mean, great choice, by the way. I'm I'm saying that objectively, you know. I'm, you get I'm that. The best. Oh, yeah, no doubt. The dude wrote a book on offenses. I get it. Uh, yeah. But, um, and then over and above that, the – the whole trying to act as a unit piece jumps in there too. So you got to worry about you. And then also what Lakahi's doing to your left. Right. Yeah, so we, got, um, we, we, we developed pretty good chemistry. Lakai and I, same with Matt, um, you know, in terms of making calls, we don't really work with it was Thailand and, and Sam on the other side, but they, they developed a great chemistry too. Um, you know, chemistry, you always, you always talk about it. Um, it's more so, so, <laughs> I'll give an example. It's more so knowing what your guard or your tackle likes and prefers. Um, I remember when I was at Virginia, let's say there's a twist. So a twist is when the defensive end who's lined up in the C gap is going to cross my face and he's going to go to the B gap and he's going to try and pick the shoulder of my guard. That three tech that my guard's actively blocking is going to loop around. They're going to try and get us on different levels and get both of them free. That's the dynamics of a twist, basically. When I was at Virginia, my guard was really great guard. He's with the Jets now. That that defensive over cross, I would love to keep my hands, keep my hands until I felt my guard hit my hand and bump me off. So I keep hands, keep hands, keep hands, go. Lakai more so preferred um, where I'd give him a shot and I would just go and I'd even feel him. He, he, he liked this. He felt almost like I was babying him if I like just kept going. He wanted me to boom, boom, right? Yeah. Um, that's just difference in preference, right? So it took me a little while to, because I'm so used to, oh, twist, gotta go, gotta go, okay, here we go, here we go. And Lakai, you know, wanted to just take it and go, and he wasn't used to bumping as much. Um, it's a preference thing. It's actually harder what Lakai's doing, um, you know, just telling me to shoot, and he's quick enough to get out there. So, um, you know, me now, I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll start, I'll start shooting just so we get on the same page a little bit. Um, and that's the only way you get that is with reps. You can't. You can't simulate that in a drill necessarily. You just got to get live reps together. Um, you know, a couple of what the hell was that, man? You know, we talk about well, this and I thought this and, you know, that's, that's how you gel. Yeah, th- there you go. And it starts in practice, you know, for people that wonder what spring football and what and what, you know, the 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 the. Exactly the um spring game and what all of that is for it's that yeah and, and as a side note the, what i would always wait for was the impact for the next hit and then i was gone so yeah, yeah exactly you know it's i can see where little kahi's come from like i mean listen yeah. i'm working on getting my craft right playing padded football but i'm not that damn bad you know i, I can see where he's coming from oh yeah yeah exactly yeah um let me bring this in too so obviously you played in what was I mean, not probably, but definitely a pretty pivotal year for the program outright. Um, You're part of the group that set the table going into the Power Five. Um, What is it like kind of speak to be playing as a part of a group the one year you're here and the year is that big a deal? Like, does does that kind of really dawn on you yet? Or is that one of the things you're going to be watching, you know, a few years and be like, wow, I helped make that happen, you know? Well, I, I love the the team we had. The 2020, what year is this? 2022 season or 2023? Yeah, we're in 22 season, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I love the team we had the 2022 season. You know, I wish we were able to to win the two lane game. But if you really look at at the game, um, you know, JRP's out here playing on just such a bad leg. The leadership he 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 showed, um, you know, that inspires me to this day. Um, 
the group that we had, we had transfers coming. We had guys that, you know, played a ton of great football for UCF. We had young guys contribute. We all gelled together. Um, I would not trade it for anything. Um, the connections I made, the friendships I've made this season um, is unbelievable. We played a lot of really good football. I hope that, um, you know, it's able to propel us to, to win a Big 12 championship next year. Um, but. I, I, I love the team we had. I look at every position group, and I got lifelong friends in, in all those groups. Um, yeah, the, the old line, the way we played, um, you know, the Duke game did not go uh, the way we wanted. But, um, uh, the, you know, that game, we were, we were getting after it, though. And I wouldn't trade. I have memories in that game of us, you know, talking crap and, you know, pancaking guys and just saying, man, so last time with this group, man, appreciate you guys. Let's just, you know. I don't know, you know, the score doesn't look great right now, but let's just beat the hell out of this D line right now, you know. So that, um, yeah, I'll I'll remember that forever. Oh, that's powerful stuff. Yeah, I'm curious now too because you mentioned JRP's leadership skills. Um, and, and and I'll say this: with what he's doing as being a prominent contributing member in the baseball team, mm-hmm. and having found a way to manage all that, that's. I'll ask you outright, like there's no better real kind of way to demonstrate the kind of leadership, the kind of um, lacking of a better word, like mental capacity that he has than seeing this happen successfully. How many people were like, oh, there's no way he was in that first meeting with Gus. And then, you know, on Twitter, was, yeah. Yeah, 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 first row, darn right. Yeah. So like, does that, is that a great way to kind of judge what his, uh, in uh, his intangibles, for lack of a better word, you know, start at? UCF is so lucky to have JRP. Um, people have no idea. We are so lucky to have JRP in this program. I saw him before Pro Day, which, by the way, he was there. He's probably like the busiest man on campus. With all yeah. He's going to be a professional baseball player. He could be a professional football player. This guy is an unbelievable athlete. I, I saw him before Pro Day, and his skin was like darker than mine. He has such a bad sunburn because he's just, think about it, he's outside all day in spring ball, and then he's outside and doing baseball. The guy's like golden brown. It's crazy. Um, I, I I got mad respect for for that. I um in high school, I um I did football and basketball in the off season. Basketball we traveled, and I did football workouts in the morning. And to that this day, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. Like just all morning football, all afternoon basketball, and that's high school. I was in like eleventh grade, and I still look back at that. JRP's doing at this at the highest level in college sports. You know, QB, QB1 doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, much respect to JRP. I, I've respected JRP since he was on the visit um, with me when I was um, being recruited here. Uh, we went to Island Wing Company. And I remember I was like, I, see. Who this? I, didn't, I, I didn't know anything about JRP, but he was just there. And I was like, who's this guy like recruiting me to come to UCF? Like, <laughs> all right, all right, dude. I don't know. I got mad respect for JRP. He's a, he's a great guy, great leader, great quarterback. I mean, they were at the very least. He was smart enough to recruit an O lineman at a wing joint. That's always a good idea, you know. There's that. Very, very smart. Yep. <laughs> um, let me ask you this, and 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 this isn't necessarily for your future or anything like that, but as a prospect, I'm kind of curious as somebody who not only covers UCF here in Orlando, I cover the Orlando Guardians as well with the XFL, and there's the USFL. With there being this much spring football in play right now. Like, how much of that is a factor in kind of the, you know, going to the next level process um, for guys coming out of college? Like, I know there's a lot of talk about opportunity and, and the second chance aspect. I've talked to Terrence Plummer, former UCF linebacker, who's playing for the Guardians now. You know, from your perspective, obviously the goal is the NFL, and I'm not saying you won't make it there, but from the perspective yeah. of somebody who's in the process, how much is that part of the conversation? Um. Not really. I mean, so this is the first year USFL and, and XFL, maybe the second year with the USFL. Um, I don't yes. really know the dynamics of it. It's the first year where they've both existed together. And I think yeah. this is USFL yeah. second year, right? This it's okay. and this is the first year of this rendition of the XFL, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, not really. If I mean, I, I, I won't speak for all um, as athletes and prospects, but if, um, if your goal is to say, okay, I'm going to get into an NFL training camp, and when that doesn't work out, uh, we'll see. I think everybody's goal should be, I'm going to put myself in the best position to, to make this roster and work everything I can. 
if you're thinking about, okay, well, you know, I don't know, this plan B's and C's right now, it, it should be all in. Um, it has not affected me at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, four months of work of playing football, a sport you love and getting paid for it. Nobody's saying that's a bad opportunity. That's awesome. Um, but no, you should be doing everything in your power to be best prepared to, I mean, you go to a training camp, you're trying to take somebody's job. That's, that's what it is. Right. And these guys are older, more experienced. They've played football. They know what they're doing. So you're not going to come in and, and have a better understanding of the game of football than them. You, there's no way. Right. So you have to do everything to physically come in and have great technique to be ready to learn, have leave your ego at the door and be in unbelievable physical shape. That's, that's what you have to do if you want to take somebody's job. And if you don't, you don't, but if you don't, because you were saying, well, you know, I had too many Chick-fil-A milkshakes and you know, I threw up at the first day of mini camp. It's not, it's not going to happen. Um, so it hasn't affected me. I mean, the goal shouldn't change based on how many spring leagues there are or not. Um, again, that's my opinion on the matter. You know, if, if I'm playing football and I'm getting paid for it, I mean, that's why I, um, I came back for a six year because after my last year at Virginia, I was prepared to declare for the draft. I've been playing the hula bowl and go from there. Um, but I said, you know, I do that. There is no guarantee I ever really put a helmet on in a real live game ever again. I love football. I would get paid to play football at UCF and get my, my master's. It'd be stupid not to. So now it's just about doing everything I can to keep the dream going. Man, and see, listen, that's that's actually for some people say it sounds silly, but I kind of get the, the sentiment, you know, how much a guy loves football has become kind of a buzz concept here in, in part of all the draft hoopla, you know. So, I mean, this I didn't mean for this to be a hey, scouts, check this out moment, but I guess I just did that by accident. So, but I, I get why you're referencing that. Um, and that's you know, more and more, and I think it's Tony Gonzalez that said this, the former. Um, Kansas City Chiefs slash uh, Atlanta Falcon great at tight end. You know, there's a lot of guys in the NFL where they're not there for the game first. Um, and maybe that'll get a team some some good results on the field, and maybe it won't because they're just that talented, but they're always going to give the edge to a guy that loves it. So, uh, yeah, it, it totally makes um, sense from that point. You know, you know what's funny? I, um, I don't mean to interrupt your next question. No, no, go for it. I, um, I love the – so – Everyone wants to know, does he love football? Is he tough, right? Those are like the two things that you really want to know that you don't see on, on I don't know, that's what anything else. So I'll be in interviews and people go, you love football? I'm like, yeah. What do you want me to say? I mean, yeah, I do. They go, are you tough? Yeah. Like, they, you know, I don't know. I think it's so funny. Um, one of the first things when I was coming to UCF, I had a coach go to me and ask me, he goes, are you tough? I'm like, yeah, I'm tough. Are you tough? Like, you know, watch my film, man. If you think I'm not tough, you know, tell me and I'll, 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 I'll prove to you I'm tough. But, you know, toughness isn't something that you can just say in a one sentence answer, you know, and prove it. So I don't know. I, I, I find those questions funny. You kind of brought that up in my head. But well, yeah, like, I, I mean, awesome. it's all a psychology game, too. Listen, if you want me to cut that part of this interview out so you could just play it for them in the room, I got you. We'll talk after. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, no, man, but um. It, it was so so with that one the, the the other big piece I want to kind of give uh go to and and we 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 touched on it with the whole um line gelling concept going from um the G5 although I would argue the American was a really good G5 conference um and it doesn't even look bad in what it's about to look like not for nothing um but the I don't think there's any argument that the biggest change will be the physics in the trenches right you got guys um, that that have the craft at another level. They got guys that 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 come bigger and then are are for lacking a better word more complete athletes. Not that we don't have those here in the building at UCF, but the there is there is a next level to that. If there's any advice you were going to give to the dudes in the trenches that are about to come out this coming season, what would it be? Okay, uh, I I find two parts in that question. So first of all, um, you know we talk about man, how are we going to be in the trenches with um you know, going from group of five to the big 12, right? Um, how much just every day, like, you know, fans love Montalvo. I'm using Montalvo as an example. Montalvo is a guy who, how often were fans like, man, I'm so grateful we got a beast like Montalvo. Not very often. I mean, right? 
Montalvo at Pro Day, he would have been tied for second on bench reps out of every D lineman at the combine. He had, I think it's like top three shuttle. He would have been top three 40 physically, you know, better than just about anybody. And we're not just saying, man, I am so grateful for that guy. He's a beast. He's a stud. He's a reason why our, our defense was so good against the run last year. We've got more dudes like that. Ricky Barber is an NFL defensive lineman. Lee Hunter is an NFL defensive lineman. I'm probably forgetting some people, but you know, we uh, had Leah Davis the year before you arrived was was the big defensive tackle too, and he was alongside Barber until he got hurt. So yeah, we've had some beefy guys in the middle on D, no question. Right. Um, there's some of the best linemen I've ever I've ever seen, I've ever blocked against. Um, there should be no concerns going to the Big Twelve with that. Um, my advice going forward is is keep doing what we're doing. You know what I mean? A lot of the times now I'll speak about old linemen a little bit. Old linemen um generally want to just gain as much weight as possible. Man, I gotta get bigger, especially man, power five D linemen. These guys are big, right? That's true to a point. I came into college as you know, I was like 245 pounds my senior year of high school. And you're not playing offensive tackle in a power five conference at 245 pounds. You got to gain weight to a certain point, right? Kaden Killer is another guy. Kaden came in light. He looks really good right now. He's put on a lot of really good weight. You got to get to a point where you start to maintain, right? You get to, I can't mention everybody's exact weight, but here, here's what I, I'm going to tell people. If you're going to the Big 12, you got to be twitched up. You got to be athletic. You got to be able to move really well as long as being strong. I would say with your goal of a body weight, be the lightest possible weight that you can stop a bull rush. If you can sit on a bull rush, be the lightest weight possible. I mean, if it has to go down to, man, okay, I'm 302 and I stopped a bull rush. I'm 301. I'm 299. Ah, 299. I'm getting bull like crazy, man. All right, 300 is my number. The lightest possible. It, what? What's the difference? If you can stop a bull rush, what's the difference of stopping a bull rush at 300 pounds and 340 pounds? There's none, but I'm, I'm twitched up. And a lot of a lot of the pancakes, a lot of the finishes, a lot of the drives come with those lighter guys who are athletic enough to drive their feet through contact. If you're big and slow, yeah, you'll be able to sit on a bull rush, but you're also a liability in a lot of aspects. If you're going to the Big 12, be the lightest possible weight that you can stop a bull rush. If that's 350 pounds, you can't stop a bull rush at 340, be 350. Right. But it's not all about just being as heavy as possible. I love that take because you know what? Screens are a thing. And I made I made the proverbial intellectual money with the coaches with the way I ran screens. And I'll leave it at that. Thank Man, you, uh, no, good answer there. A hundred percent. By the way, I'll build on this. Um, for those that don't remember, Montalvo went from being a walk on to a scholarship athlete. So over and above the physicals. A dude has the heart for it, man. Yeah, I, 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 that's a, that's a, I know it's good that you drive with that example. I know it's the other side of the ball, but you know, right now as a program, UCF's trying to be that walk on in the Big 12. That's yeah. looking at the scholarship. That's a great, we, we have built a great proverb today. That's what yeah. we samurai on the O line do here. That was my martial arts reference there, right? Well, what was it? What is that? I didn't catch that. O linemen are samurai, whereas, Whereas defensive linemen are more berserker, like Viking warrior types. That's kind of the way I. I mean, devil. I mean, yeah, I'll, yeah, that's good. I'll take, I'll take samurai for a lineman. I like it. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, the martial art itself would be sumo. I, listen, we've all seen the replacements, and if you haven't watched it, for good, goodness sake, you know, Keanu Reeves people. But yeah. Anyways, uh, Ryan, man, listen, I even kept you a little longer than I meant to. We could probably go for another three hours, but you got things to do. You got a life, you got a career you're trying to build in the game. I got to let you do that. Um, tell the world where you can be found, my friend, and any other thoughts you have before you want to go. Yeah, um, I appreciate everybody tuning in, man. I appreciate you, Kyle, for having me on the, the show. It's been good. Um, appreciate you reaching out to me after Pro Day, too, man, to meet you formally because, you know, I always poke fun and, and talk to Trace, but, you know, I never got to meet you face to face. So, now I get to do that with you too. So that's pretty good. Um, you know, any, any, any support, any, um, just, you know, you can find the the link on my Twitter to the, the fundraiser, any reading up about it. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily expect donations. If you want to donate, that's phenomenal. Um, but ju just an understanding, just getting a conversation going. Um, Awareness is enough. What was that? Awareness is enough. Awareness is enough. Exactly. So, you know, I'm so thankful for, for everybody UCF. Um, 
yeah, it's it's been real. I appreciate you. Uh, yeah, I'll be I'll be on Twitter uh, during games. I'll be live tweeting games. You can't do that when you're when you're a player, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just be just be aware. This is this is what I'll leave it on. If you are a fan and you're getting ready to roast the online, this goes for you too, Kyle. I will be there ready to put you in a proverbial chokehold of logic, and I will show you why it's not the online's fault. So that's where I will leave it. Buddy, I love it. Because, hey, listen, I, I don't know. There there have been times I've asked questions of certain moments, and there have been other times I've defended you guys. You know, oh, I, I know. at the end of the day, JRP isn't a lottery ticket uh, a lottery ticket waiting to happen for a big play without you guys doing some things right. Those are the facts of the Great case. Way of putting it. Yeah, exactly. Um, awesome. Listen, great time, man. I loved it. An honor, joy, and privilege. I love how you tolerate a guy who is so very critical of the ACC on a great on a regular basis. Uh, and listen, man, I'm gonna be I'm obviously gonna be watching and cheering. And let's not make this the only time we talk, my guy. Sounds very good, man. I'll be happy to come on anytime. All right, big thanks to Ryan uh, for spending some time and giving us some insight. I thought that was fantastic, and I love talking about the nuts and bolts of this kind of stuff. Now, Kyle. You were talking about how with the pro day prior to when we heard the interview about how you think that the big 12's idea of a sort of combine, if mm -hmm. you will, a conference combine is a bad idea. I do. I do. Um, because it, in that case, if you're having a central location and I get their, their talks of it for the big 12, at least being held in Jerry world. So I get that, you know, a bigger facility might prevent some of these, but there's two big things that I think are, are kind of, will kind of be pushed aside. Um, one is if you have it all in one place, that means fewer bodies can participate. That means there's fewer surprise guys that could come out. Right. For example, just this past, uh, uh, well, two years ago now, uh, maybe three. Um, Jacob Harris, everybody remember him as a UCF receiver. Incredibly tall. He had the one thing you can't teach, height. Throughout the year, he had troubles catching the football uh, until the very end of the season, and he broke out, for all intents and purposes, in um, in Raymond James against South Florida, had his clearly his best, best game, not just statistically, but in catching the football in general, period. And it was his performance at UCF's Pro Day that got him eventually draft. I think it was fourth, way higher than anybody would have thought, uh, by the uh, Los Angeles Rams. Eventually was on the roster for that Super Bowl team, too, if I remember correctly. But the punchline is this, my friends. The Jacob Harris's don't get accounted for if it goes regional. I'm not sure he's invited uh, to such an event. Are we sure about that, though? I mean, you're going to get more players getting invited to that than – the, then, you know, to the combine in Indianapolis, right? I mean, but, you know, but he's more likely to get lost in the fold, right? And, and and I get, by the way, I get concerns surrounding the the Indianapolis uh, combine for the the NFL combine itself that people mm -hmm. can use the combine to kind of trick fi trick people and 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 you know be prepared for that event and then bamboozle those that are watching them and then they get a really good interview and then they come out and they flame out. I I, I get all of the above on that. And, and it's a concern I share as an analyst who covers uh, the NFL as the student of the game. But, um, you like that drop in? But the, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, I'll allow it. <laughs> I'll allow it. Uh, the, um, but the piece that's concerning isn't so much that they won't be able to go, Jeff. It's, it's a matter of the list of names is now you gotta, there's more work to pull them out. There's just more volume at the event. Also local media, won't necessarily be present, right? If the event is in Texas, the chances of me appearing on behalf of the Night Shift, Shift Black blah, Night Shift Podcast and the Black and Gold Banneret. Am I going to have to beep that? Okay, anyway, carry on. Oh, God, I didn't even think of that. Um, um, <laughs> the Night Shift <laughs> Podcast and the Black and Gold Banneret, if I'm not there, um, or, I, or if it's in Texas, I might not be able to be there. Nor Elo yourself. I don't know, maybe... Maybe maybe Nick can run there as a long distance kind of a marathon kind of a thing for him. But let, let me play devil's advocate on that though. Sure, I'll do that. <laughs> so we don't. <laughs> so we so we won't be able to go to Dallas. Mm -hmm. All right. The Big Twelve doesn't care. All right. What but they care. Is, what, and, and the, the and the teams are like and the teams are like okay whatever. 
the whole objective of this is to get these guys looked at by scouts, right. not by the press, right? But how do the scouts get the story for, let's say, one Shaquem Griffin? I they're mean, not getting. Th- listen, they're they're. I'll tell you what, they're not getting it from the press like they used to. Okay. The media, when it comes to scouting, has more or less been shut out because there are so many scouts out there that are part of professional teams. They are out there looking for and finding the talent through their direct contacts on coaching staffs. Sure. You know, uh, now, that's not, to, that's not to say that the media doesn't play a role on right. occasion, but it isn't nearly what it used to be at the college to pro gradient level. Sure. You know, and, and listen, you're, you're, you're throwing what I'll now dub the draft Nick defense, and it's 100% accurate from a football perspective. But what made, and the reason why I pulled Shaquem Griffin out, what makes Shaquem Griffin, Griffin unique? It wasn't his football skills, awesome as they were. He didn't get a Nike ad because the dude was uh, a converted DB to linebacker. He was a special story. Over and above his physical impediments, what he was as a human being and story was what got him off the page. And then the football stats made him a draftee. And you lose that element. Well, the guy was a defensive player of the year in the conference. Sure. I mean, you know, if we're talking about that specific case. But but that's Draftnik defense back on you. Draftniks don't give a damn about the American in that concept. Oh, I don't think that's entirely true. Because you know, you know, you can find talent there, right? Talent, talent will eventually rise to the top. Sure. One way or the other. There are NAIA guys that get drafted. Oh yeah. Oh, well, I mean, you know, you know, they'll they'll be they'll be uh, uh, arena league guys that find their way, but they have to have a story first. No one gives a damn about Kurt Warner if he's not a dude that was stocking groceries previously. Same concept, and that well, here, well, here's well, here's the thing with that. Like Kurt was in NFL camps before he before he was working at at, at the Ingles. Sure, it's the football part. He's already at camps, but he's not starting. It was the sensational story that made him a Super Bowl quarterback eventually. Until then, he was just a camp arm. See, he's I, I don't, I, I, don't I don't know if I agree with you on that. I I, I think that you know, that. Scouts and general managers and directors of pro personnel, they don't give a rip about the headlines as um, unless they're actually really bad headlines. And then, not, but and then the well, more cynical of us would argue they don't even really care about that. The what they <laughs> what they, re, what they really care about is do you show up? Do you understand what we're trying to do here? And can you play if if, if called upon? And that is agnostic of how much media coverage you get. I, I think. Okay. And yeah, and you're making the same football argument, I feel like, to an extent. You're, you're rewording a little bit by saying the, uh, the scouts and such don't care. And if asked, I'm sure they will agree. However, behind every single box check card and everything that's built out by those coaches – there is a human element, okay? And that human element does get swayed by these stories, but they can't be swayed if they're not out there. And I'm not here to tell you that this is everybody, okay? But, and, and I use the, the example of uh, Shaquem Griffin. He's kind of hyperbolic in the way that he ended up being such a big story. Uh, and you mentioned, by the way, the Conference Defensive Player of the Year. He was a story before that happened. Let's be clear about that. True, true. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, and that's not to take away that that wasn't a factor. I'm sure it was, but that story coming up and popping up when you talk about things like accolades from conference player of the year and, and everything that happened. And of course the program, yeah. uh, he was also, he was also voted conference player of the year because he was pretty daggum good at football. Yeah. <laughs> you right. know, that's, that's my case. It's like, th- that's, that's the overwhelming, but if you, if you hadn't driving force. about, about, Sha- about Keem, as a football player, um, the conference player of the year didn't alter that in any direction, right? It didn't. Somebody, nobody said, oh, wait, let's draft him because he's the American Defensive Conference Player of the Year. That's not a thing. No one uttered that sentence in those very same walls you speak to, right? Yeah, but, but they're also not drafting him because look at this guy who played with one hand. They didn't uh, draft him because of that either. They drafted him because they thought he, Seattle drafted him because they thought he could play. Well, actually, 
Richard Sherman might argue with, with that. I interviewed him in 2014, and okay. he said that Pete Carroll was basically running a group that had one thing in common. They were almost like the words I, I used to ask him about this was, is it is it a support group for guys with chips on their shoulders? And Sherman was like, yes, that is absolutely what Pete Carroll is running there. So knowing a guy is going to fit your camp is where you're going to get those stories. Okay. I see what you mean there. I see what you mean there. I, I Okay. I see. I, I just I think our I think our argument might be uh, a little bit on the semantic end of it. A hundred percent. You know, because the NFL, as we know, is it, it, it is the world's and I think most thoroughly run meritocracy. If you can play, you will play. And if you can't, you won't. It there's no charity involved. Agreed. And and with that in mind, it does get into that weed sometimes because the competition is so insane and so close. Like point oh 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 three something in your 40 time might make a difference. Of course, that's hyperbolic in itself. But because it's that meritocracy, every little thing that could be good about you does matter. It could be the tiebreaker that makes you put you uh, beyond that 54th man mark. Right. Mm -hmm. OK. Interesting. All right. We'll see how this goes with this year. I'm interested to see where Ryan goes if he goes, and if and if he doesn't go in the draft, where does he fit in 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 camp? You know, we've you and I have always had debates, Kyle, about you know, big guy, right? Mm -hmm. Extra big, six ten. What's the number one rule about lineman, Kyle? Oh well, the low man wins. It's funny you mention that, Jeffrey. I actually had a little conversation with Herb Hand at Pro Day about his coaching, Ryan Swoboda, and he's got another guy who's currently on the line who's 6'11". By the way, new co-offensive coordinator, Herb Hand, in addition to being the O-line coach. Bing! Well done, Jeff. And, and and he even said he had to learn a new – I forget the way, but he, what, what I had to learn in order to coach him was, was I think was an actual phrase he used in explaining it, um, throw a pad level away. The term he started to use was body demeanor, and we Ryan and I talk about that a little bit. If you want to listen to it in the segment there uh, from his perspective, but the way coach hand put it was um, just because somebody's pad level is higher. Doesn't mean they're not lower than the guy. Say example, you got to do that's damn near seven foot, not mentioning any apes, <laughs> but hmm. if somebody's that tall and there's a guy that's, let's say only my height, six, five, my pad level be may be lower, but if his hands are under my shoulders and into my chest and lifting my shoulder pads, I'm done. <laughs> well, worst case scenario for Ryan could probably use some help on the basketball team because we, <laughs> we, need, we need big men. And I'm just saying, I, I'm just putting it out there. You know, I don't Oops. know if Ryan played, played hoops in high school. Maybe did you, uh, you know, he would certainly defend the post well, I think. Uh, he would, I think, listen, he would be quite the rim protector. I'm just <laughs> saying. Okay. Work on that vertical leap. So, all right. We come back. We got lots more to talk about baseball, softball, track. Nick Bryson joining us to talk all about, about all that. We'll be right back. This is the Night Shift Podcast. All right, we're back here on the Night Shift Podcast. Jeff, Kyle, Bryson, and Nick joining you here. And let's talk a little baseball to start out. Bryson, I want to start with you. Uh, recap of uh, USF. Uh, not a good way, not the best way, obviously, to start the conference season. Going one and two at home against your rivals in the war on I-4 here. Um, UCF did come back and win um, uh, uh, the... Uh, what do you call it? They did come back and win the third game of the series, 12 to nine. Um, but you had an interesting number here, um, Bryson, in that UCF had its lowest batting average in a three game series on the season. Yes. So this, uh, this batting average has actually already been going down since the start of the year, since the start of the season. So to go through the list, it was 352 against Siena, 290 against Clemson. 321 against Georgia Southern. Then it goes down to 270 against Troy. Dartmouth yeah. there at 340, but you could say that that was inflated thanks to that, you know, that 12-10 game, that sort of thing. And then you have 260 against Maryland, and now it's dropped to 247 
against USF. Now, of course, this comes when the pitchers had one of its lo- one of its lowest ERAs of a mm-hmm. three game series this year. The only lower ERAs than USF this in a three game series this season are Dartmouth, but of course the defense, the fielding defense and errors failed them there, and then Siena, which is Siena. So. <laughs> Uh, so of course, when the pitchers are starting to settle out, and Lovelady even said post game that he likes kind of likes how the the rotation has switched right now with now Jacob Marlowe joining the fold, and he had a solid outing on Saturday. Saturday, and Dom Stagliano, who did not exactly pitch his best, but I think he's pitched enough before that that if he has an off day, it is what it is. It's Sunday. So, and then of course Rudy Gomez is continuing to be Rudy Gomez. So. I th- the, it's so funny that, of course, when one side of the ball is improving, the other side is almost going down the tubes. Now, Sunday, <laughs> I think, provides a little bit of hope because that's where they were able to manufacture runs. The thing is, is that it was on Sunday. So they uh, the, bat, the USF was already de- deep in their pitching at that point. So you got to be able to take that and apply it to earlier on because Rudy Gomez needs run support. Like Rudy, Rudy I implore everybody to go to the black to, to the YouTube channel and watch the all the post games from this weekend as from this weekend, but especially Sunday as well for Greg Lovelady. But point is this: the players are even though they're some of them performances are really well, they do really want to win. And so not getting this one, I think, is going to stick with them. And Lovelady said, like, you know, we just got to be able to get back to what we were, what we were. And he said that he admitted that they panicked a little bit Mm -hmm. when the when the batting started to go cold. They started to push things more, which ended up leading to the performances that we saw in games one and two. So hopefully they'll be able to turn things around uh, around. They do have a big road trip coming up against two top 30 opponents in Miami in midweek and East Carolina all on the road. And considering what this team did against teams like Clemson and FSU, they were able to really step up to the plate in that sort of game. I, I wouldn't, I would hope that they do that again there. Well, they're going to need to, if they want to, pull back up that RPI because right now they're at 139 in the RPI. Now wins over ranked teams like Miami and ECU on the road will be able to do that. But this is a real show me week for this team to see if they can pull it off. And by the way, um, they, they haven't, they've won, I think, what is it? One Saturday game since the Clemson series at the end of February. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of where we are right now with this. Um, By the way, I wanted to just see, uh, where is Clemson in the RPI? I haven't seen the 46th. So, yeah, not quite where Clemson, where we're not quite maybe where we're used to seeing Clemson. Um, but, you know, like I said, this big four, four games right here, Miami and then three at ECU. ECU, by the way, they're going to come into that series kind of ticked off. They lost two out of three to Houston. That was a surprise. So, and they're coming in with two of the with the top two ERAs in the conference. In two yeah. two of their pitchers have the lowest two ERAs in the conference. Of- Shocker! I mean, they can what. pitch now. <laughs> these these yeah batters are definitely going to be in for be in for a test. I'll tell you yes. what. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll be monitoring that one as well. Uh, the Miami game, and then of course the ECU games will be on ESPN Plus. By the way, Nick, uh, you mentioned uh, one little uh, and uh, baseball debut Thad Ward. Uh, making his debut for the uh, Washington Nationals, two UCF players on major league rosters to start the the, ML, the MLB season. Obviously, Thad uh, is in DC, and of course, uh, American League Most Valuable Player candidate Dylan Moore, uh, utility player for the Seattle Mariners. But yeah, two two major league stars, and you have a little post on uh, Black and Gold Banneret, yes, sir, talking about you know players also that we see in the minors who may or may not get a shot at the bigs this year as well. Yeah. Uh, right now, the only guy really playing is Thad, just because uh, Dylan's hurt, but he should be back mm. later in the month, according to ESPN. A little rough outgo- start for Ward, unfortunately, because two innings, two hits, and two runs, because one of them was a home run, but in yeah. the guy's defense, 
As a middle reliever, though, right? Yeah, he's a reliever, and he's pitching against Atlanta. So it's like your debut is against one of the better teams in the league. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's one outing. Don't panic. He'll be fine. Yeah. Um, Let's move over to uh, softball. How about uh, Grace Jewell of UCF? Three appearances this year for UCF softball. 2-0 record in her two starts, allowing just one run on five hits. Named the uh, American Athletic Conference's Pitcher of the Week. Uh, for UCF softball, who right now are 23 and 18, and uh, took those three games at ECU uh, over this past weekend. This is on the heels of dropping two out of three to uh, Wichita State at home. So the Knights are now back at four and two in conference. And uh, right now, they're actually they're, they're looking at FGCU on Wednesday. And then they have actually this weekend off and then they play home FIU Tuesday before they head out all the way out to Tulsa um, to play out there mid mid April. And Bryson useful break, I think, for this team right now. Is that right? Because it looked like they kind of like they need a little bit of something to kind of tap the brakes and figure things out before moving forward after that, after, you know, losing those uh, those two games to Wichita State. I'll try to channel my inner Eric Lopez right here. So you go for it. So one observation I've actually seen with this team is I've noticed that they're starting to de-emphasize Sarah Willis on offense. If you look at ECU, only her and Grace Jewell pitched the entire weekend, which get, which is giving very, very Gianna Mancha, Kema Woodall vibes from them. And consider, and ever since Sarah Willis started de-emphasizing the bat, only making like pinch hitting appearances since that first Wichita State game, this ECU series, she had one of her best pitching performances, I think, of the season. So hmm. I think that what this break could really do for her is allow her to really just hone in more on the pitching and just really and essentially just de-emphasize the hitting and just have her be more of a pinch hit. Just focus on that, yeah. Right. So that way you can – because I think that what initially when we when we were bringing in, we were hoping like, oh, she could be like, you know, Shoei Otane softball version, you know, switch hitter, do the pitching, all that stuff. But it seems like it hasn't worked out exactly the way they needed to because they need a pitcher more than they need a hitter out of her right now because she plays outfield normally, and the outfield's already crowded enough as it is. Yeah. So we need this team needs a pitcher right now. They need a second pitcher to go along with Grace Jewell, who, by the way, has been having a really a breakout season, like you, like you mentioned. So I breakout think, player of the year nominee potentially. So, um, so this break is going to be very major. But let's not lest we forget, FGCU is ranked number fifty four in the RPI rankings. So they are not nothing to not not nothing to sneeze at and i i also uh be, got to mention this ecu series is a major rebound after losing to wichita state as far as confidence goes mm-hmm. i think this really is a good pr- kind of prove it moment to be like okay we got off on the rough foot a little bit with wichita but we're gonna be right there with them when conference goes because wichita state i think is arguably the greatest contender other than ucf for this aac title this year so bouncing back like this is like okay here we all right we're good let's recharge with this break and keep on going okay um a couple things we wanted to update you on the calendar as well so women's golf concluded their regular season they will play in the aac championship at brooksville in two weeks we'll be covering that pretty soon women's tennis also in their aac championships uh on the 20th 21st uh 22nd and 23rd um, so, you know, again, we have, you know, track and tennis, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, uh not, uh, also the men's golf team is also going to be playing, uh, in their conference championships as well. So golf and tennis coming up in the, as we call it, the country club sports, but we're going to wrap with Nick Porcelli and track and field and Nick, the latest on UCF track and field right now, because they checked they, uh, to me, the big story right now is they just checked in at eighth. Uh, right. In the latest uh, Division One outdoor poll, um, they were number three to start the year. Now, the main reason they're up there is because of the performances of all their uh, short distance events. Like they've been killing it. Renaya Jones obviously is the big star. She had a great weekend at the Florida Relays. She got first in the hundred meter hurdle, and she was part of the winning team in the uh, hurdle relays. Who actually in that game they not only set the program record with a 53.45 but they also 
uh, became the, that's also the seventh fastest time ever in that event in college athletics. Mm-hmm. So, the, yeah, wow. those ladies, yeah, they're doing really well and they're uh, making it a really good season. I was looking it up actually right here, and I, I found it because you know this is the first time we actually gotten the chance to to talk really in depth about the rankings. And yeah. you know, I'm looking at this like it, it does kind of look like a uh, they they give certain athletes um, and the the times or marks they put. It's almost like it's almost like a form of like the decathlon where you get a certain amount of points yeah. for a certain level of performance, and that's what pushed UCF up to. Third last week and eighth right now. Yeah, they dropped five spots, but yeah, um, but you know they, they, that that can change from week to week. And of course, who's up there? Renaya Jones, uh, third in the country in uh, in the one hundred hurdles. She uh, in the Florida relays over this past week, like twenty, uh, where she put up posted a uh, twelve. Was it a twelve point seven five? So they go. I mean, wow. Um, so yeah. again, we're going to be keeping an eye on them going forward and then uh, last but not least nick porcelli you and i witnessed history last weekend yes sir your yes. orlando guardians de- coming in at owen six beating the undefeated dc defenders whose defensive coordinator is when greg williams kyle nash yes yes uh, i walked by him on the sideline yeah he must have been thrilled about he that happy. uh he in 37 36 was the final um in the uh, and and key to the game, Nick was uh, was Terrence Plummer. He uh, he made a, a few key tackles uh, yes. for uh, for Orlando, and now they believe it or not, even having gotten their first win in week number seven, they are not out of the playoff chase yet. In the words of head coach Terrell Buckley, thirty three point three percent chance. Yes. So isn't it amazing what a win does? You you win a game and suddenly all these fans are like, we suck or like we can make the playoffs. <laughs> right. Well, hey, I mean hey, I'm, it's, I'm hoping. it's I'm never hoping. never say never. And they yeah. play uh Arlington last home game for the uh for the Guardians this uh is for the season is this weekend against the uh Arlington Renegades and one Rennell Hall. Yeah. Uh former UCF Knight. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. And Nick has been doing a great job keeping a Keeping track of XFL, uh, UCF players in the XFL, and then of course we'll have the USFL pretty soon uh, coming yep. up after this as we approach the uh, the end of the XFL season, the beginning of the USFL. So shout out to um, Big Cat Bryant, just got signed by the Memphis Showboats. Yeah, that's right, Big Cat Bryant, Memphis. We'll probably see, uh, and we'll also probably see Marlon Williams once again for Birmingham. Go ahead, go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, about to say more O linemen hate. Thanks, Nick, for leaving out our own Cole Schneider. For getting in the Birmingham team as well. Oh, that's uh, right, Cole Schneider. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> Sorry, our apologies. No I linemen. Like, Everybody I, hates O linemen. I like. We don't hate O linemen. This we devoted an entire segment of the show to O linemen for crying out loud. Exactly. I have a Tristan Worf's jersey. I love O linemen. Exactly. Oh yeah, sure. The one that predicted Pretty Boy Brady. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, for all of us here at the Night Shift Podcast, make sure you follow our written content at blackandgoldbanneret.com, the home of the UCF Knights on SB Nation. Follow us individually on Twitter. I'm at Jeff underscore Sharon. Kyle's at the SOTG for the student of the game. Bryson, it's Bryson Turner. Nick Porcelli at Nick Porcelli 2. Drew, who was with us earlier, is at Stat Boy Drew. Eric, of course, at Eric Lopez Elo. And of course, UCF. Uh, Banneret underscore SBN collectively. Thanks again to all of you for listening on our newly branded Night Shift podcast. We will see you next week. Until then, go Knights, charge on. <laughs>